Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Bridge. So glad you're worshiping with us today as we kick off a new sermon series that we're calling Joy Full. I'm particularly thankful that Pastor Ken referred to me as the briefer preacher rather than the shorter preacher, because if he had done that, I would have also had to point out that I happen to be the preacher with hair. <laughs> but since he didn't say that, I won't go there either. We're going to be in the book of Philippians, Philippians, about halfway through the New Testament. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one, and that can be yours to keep. Please consider that as a gift from Faith Bridge to you. Before we jump into the message, let's uh, take a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for this new day and the privilege we have to be in your house, worshiping your son in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all of the opportunities you put before us to grow, to love, to become the men and women, the boys and girls that you have created and called us to be. We want to learn more about that today. And so as we turn to your word in Philippians, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, over the last decade or so, it has been my good fortune to travel over a great deal of the globe, meeting uh, hundreds and hundreds of people traveling thousands, thousands of miles. And uh, in all of those travels, miles, people, years, so forth, I have never met anyone who didn't want to be happy. Now, I've met a Debbie Downer or two along the way, an Eeyore here and there, but by and large, 99.9% .9 of everyone wants to be happy. It is a universal desire, which says to me that it is a desire that the Creator placed within us. God wants us to have the experience of being happy. Now, I know that may come as a bit of a shock to some of you who perhaps up until today have thought of God only in terms of being the ultimate spoil sport, the big rule maker in the sky, the one who reigns on our parade, the one who really doesn't want us to have a good time, but nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, after all, God invented fun. God invented happy, and he wants us to experience those things, but... He also wants, to, wants us to experience something more than just happy. God wants us to experience what the Bible calls joy. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is here today and gone tomorrow. It is often tied to our circumstances. If my life is good, then I'm happy. If my bank account is full... If my marriage or my dating life is going well, if my kids are okay, if I like my job, then I'm happy. But that is such a dangerous way to live because any one of those things that I just mentioned could be gone like that. And if that is what we've got our happiness tied to, we are in a very precarious, dangerous place. Yes, God does want us to experience happiness, but even more so, He wants us to know joy. Joy is something which is rooted much deeper. It's not tied to circumstances. Rather, it is tied to a relationship, namely a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. It is something that is abiding. It stays with us. It provides us that sense of hope and peace, and trust, and faith, even if everything around us is falling down, if we have the joy that God offers us, it stays. 
Because God stays. Jesus comes to live in our hearts, and he's there for good. We're going to be looking at the book of Philippians throughout this series because this book is commonly known as the epistle of joy or the letter of joy. At least 12 times Paul uses that word, joy, as he writes the letters. He loved the Philippian Christians, had a strong, joyful relationship with them. And we're going to see throughout this series that God imparts joy to us through any number of avenues, any number of different ways. God sends his joy. But the one thing that they all have in common is Jesus. We're going to come back to him over and over and over. Today we're going to be talking about Joy in Christ-centered community. How relationships that are built around Jesus are a primary means by which God shares his joy with us. Our text for this morning is in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 3. Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I love the way Paul begins this letter. I thank God every time I remember you. Every time I think about you, it brings a smile to my face and warmth to my heart. I wonder who that person is for you or who that group of persons is for you, that every time you think about them, every time you recall being with them or a shared experience, it just brings warmth and joy to your soul. As I wrote the message, it dawned on me that practically every happy memory I have is tied to another person or a group of people. My wife can testify to this because... Since we've been married, uh, one of the quirky things that she's had to get used to about me is that from time to time, with no warning whatsoever, I will break into spontaneous laughter for for no outwardly uh, discernible reason. And of course, she'll look at me and ask, what is so funny? And nine times out of ten, I'll say to her, well, I was just thinking about this time or I remember this occasion and I go back to childhood or high school or college or some, some experience in my life that, like Paul, brings joy to my heart and I can't help but laugh out loud. She thinks that is so weird, but I can't help it. In that regard, I am like Paul. My remembrance of those people and those times brings joy to my heart and I thank God for those times. Matter of fact, in that first verse there, verse 3, Paul lifts up for us two miracles. Now, we don't often think of them as miracles. We tend to take them for granted. But if we stop and consider them, they really are miraculous. And the first one of those is the capacity to remember. It is just amazing that God designed us in such a way that our brains, composed of flesh and blood, can take data, experience in, and hold on to it. And at some point down the future, we can pull it up again for our pleasure and our enjoyment. That is a remarkable gift that God has given to us. Now, granted, I'll admit I'm losing that capacity with every passing year. But as long as I have it, it's one that I really enjoy. And I'm sure that you do too. The other miracle that Paul highlights in this opening verse is the miracle of relationship that God designed us in such a way that we were intended to be in relationship with one another. From the very beginning, we read in Genesis 2.18, after God had created Adam, he said, it is not good for you to be alone. And he made Eve. God designed us to be 
in relationship with one another. And one of the many reasons that he did that is because he knew that relationships have the capacity, have the potential to provide us with joy, most especially Christ-centered relationships. And in the remainder of the passage, Paul highlights for us three ways that those kinds of relationships, our involvement in a Christ-centered community, how that can bring joy to our lives. And the first of those is how doing the work of God together brings us joy. You know, God does have work for us to do. God has a purpose for us as individuals and corporately as a body. Here at Faith Bridge, our work is to make more and stronger disciples who make more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ. And in the accomplishment of that task, of that work, we begin to find a joy that cannot be found anywhere else. Look at verse 4. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Because of your partnership in the gospel, preaching the word of God, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, supporting me when I needed help, I find joy in that relationship, Paul says. And as we do God's work together, we begin to discover a joy that can't be found anywhere else. Now, without question, Pastor Ken has done a marvelous job of planting and leading Faith Bridge Church. I am sure that Faith Bridge would not be the church that it is today without his leadership, but he would be the first to say he could have never done it alone. No way. He needed people to come around. He needed God's people to come around. There needed to be multiple experiences of Christ-centered community where we locked arms together, moving forward, doing the work God has called us to do in this place and in this time. Last week is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Super Sunday. If you were here, you know what a fun, joyful day that was. Really, the, the video, as well as it is done, captures just a smidge of the energy and enthusiasm that was here on this campus. But Pastor Ken couldn't have done that by himself. The, the entire Faith Bridge staff could have not done it by itself. Instead, hundreds of people came together, each one exercising their God given gifts and talents and doing the work that was necessary to make sure that 101 people came here for the first time, to make sure that 900 instead of 200 bags were provided for those who were hungry. Pastor Ken has called us to double our impact over the next five years. That's not going to happen because one person makes up their mind. No, that's going to happen because we all agree together. We take advantage, we leverage the strength and the joy that is found in relationship, and we move the kingdom forward. And there's a bonus actually tacked onto that, because as we are doing work for Jesus, he is doing work in us. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus is constantly at work in our lives. He has a goal for us as individuals. He wants to make us more like him than we were the day before. And one of the means that happens is by engaging in work with the body of Christ. So that's the first way Paul highlights for us joy that can be found in community. He quickly moves on to a second means. You know, it's unfortunate, but um, not every life experience, of course, lends itself to joy. There is suffering out there. There is hurting. There is pain. And yet, even in the midst of that, we're going to see still joy can abide. I'm not talking about a fake plastic smile. No, I'm talking about a deep-rooted confidence 
that Jesus is with me and Jesus is going to walk with me and see me through whatever I am facing. Paul says in verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Now remember, Paul is writing this letter from a Roman prison. He is in chains. He has lost his freedom. It is not a pleasant place to be. And yet, this is the most joyful letter in the entire New Testament. Why? Because of the community that he had with these Philippians. The joy that came from his fellowship with them. He drew strength from that. He carries them in his heart. It is the knowledge of the love that they share, the things that they've done in the past, the fact that they have stuck with him through thick and thin and that they are praying for him even now and supporting and loving him even now. That grants to him a joy that he can't find anywhere else. None of us will soon forget the devastation and the horror of Hurricane Harvey. And yet, as terrible as that event was, it provided a platform for many persons to experience the kind of joy that Paul is talking about here. The younger couple that was highlighted in the video just a few moments ago, Philip and Rachel Barrington, 2016 was a big year for those guys. Uh, that was the year that they got married. That was the year that they bought their first home. As a matter of fact, Philip told me they moved into that home on their wedding night. And life was good. They were excited. They're starting out a new adventure together in their new home. And life is good. Well, fast forward about a year and Harvey is looming. It's bearing down on our city their neighborhood was known to be flood prone. And so they decided to play it safe and go stay with Philip's parents where it did not flood. All the while hoping against hope that their home would be okay. But eventually uh, the phone call came from a friend of theirs who had seen their home telling them it's underwater. I'm so sorry to tell you this, but the place is just devastated. Philip said it was the most difficult phone call he can remember receiving. Something they had worked so hard together for, and now it's gone. And yet, even in the midst of that life-changing tragedy, they found joy. Why? Because the moment the house was accessible, the moment that they could get back in there, who should show up but their grow group? the people that we saw on that video and more. And immediately they organized themselves and they laid out a schedule where someone would be there every day making sure something was happening in that house to get it restored. Tearing out the drywall and mucking out the mud and all of the other things that have to happen to restore a home. John McDonald, who leads our Helping Hands ministry, showed up with his crew and the love was poured out on that young couple. One gentleman in their girl group said to them, look, guys, you're just starting out. We don't want you to empty your retirement fund to do this. We're going to come alongside and we're going to help. As we talked about it, Philip was candid enough to say to me, you know, there were those days where we wondered, are we going to make it? It's so hard. And yet... Because of the faithfulness of their grow group and the ministry of this church, they did make it to the point that they have often said to one another since, we don't know how anyone who isn't in a grow group would have made it. Because they came alongside them and they provide moral support and spiritual support and energy physical energy to change things, and they provided material support and help, all the while just pouring out the love of Jesus. Maybe you didn't go through Harvey, but it is simply part and parcel of this life. We are all going to go through something. This is a broken world. 
Suffering is going to happen to each and every one of us. The question is not whether we will suffer. The question is, will we suffer alone? Or will we be able to receive the joy that can come through relationship in Christ-centered community? So, God gives us joy through working together to accomplish God's purposes. God gives us joy as we come alongside one another and encourage and lift one another up. But there's another kind of joy that Paul mentions here toward the end of this passage. He calls it, uh, uh, he describes it as a joy that is characteristic of the affection of Christ Jesus. In that last verse there, verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It's important to note that Paul is not sliding into some sort of artificial sentimentality here. He's not getting all syrupy sweet because he, he's in jail and he feels sorry for himself, so he's just going to write these flowery words. No, 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 no. This word affection was used by the Greeks to communicate a deep level of love and commitment, of devotion. Not something that's just dressed up in here today and gone tomorrow, but no, I love you, I'm with you, I'm for you. We are connected to one another. He's saying to them, I, I want to be with you. I yearn to be with you because I love you. I'd rather be with you than anywhere else. What a marvelous gift it is, friends, to have people in this world that we want to be with. I don't know about you, but I have plenty of folks in the world that I don't want to be with. It's a gift of God. It is an expression of his love for us, and it is a means of his granting joy to our lives when he gives us people that we want to be with. It's the simple gift of friendship rooted in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. It's having people in your life that you can just go to a ball game with or watch a movie or get coffee or play a round of golf or wh whatever they can. Gather together and study God's word as grow groups do. This is a beautiful gift that God has given to us and one that I think we take for granted. We don't think much about. Yeah, people are people and they're there. But do you really have those people in your life that you yearn to be with, that mean so much to you, that have been such a support and demonstrated such love that you'd rather be with them than anybody else? That's what grow groups are all about here, providing that kind of environment, that kind of joy. It's interesting to me that, that Paul describes this he says to them, I, I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I, I, I puzzled over that phrase for a while. What, what does he mean by the affection of Christ Jesus? And, and then it dawned on me. Jesus yearns to be with you and me more than anything else. And what Paul is writing there to those Philippians is merely a reflection of the love of Jesus and how desperately he wants to be with you and me. Jesus doesn't want to be some remote, far-off somebody that you check in with occasionally on Sundays or pray to when you're in trouble. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your closest friend, and he will go to any length in order for that to happen. And the reason I know that is because of the cross. The cross is the proof that Jesus will do whatever he must do to restore our relationship with us. Because we're all separated from him. Even though God said to us, look, I, I am life. I am the source of life. And if you separate yourself from me, the only alternative is death. We each and every one made that choice. We walked away from God. But he didn't give up on us. No, Jesus said, I'm not going to let him go. I'm going after him. I'm going to restore that relationship. And he did. He came. 
and he walked among us and he taught us and then he died for us to show his love and to secure our forgiveness. In just a few weeks, we'll celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, the indication that he lives today and he is more desperate for a relationship with you than ever. Do you have that relationship? As much as I want to encourage and urge you today to be a part of a grow group, even more so, I I want you to know the joy that comes from knowing Jesus because that's where it all starts. So there's a lot of joy that comes from being in a grow group. And the very greatest joy comes from being in a relationship with Jesus. Well, if you put those two things together, man, it just does not get any better than that. And that's what we call a grow group. Where a group of people out of a common love and devotion and commitment to Christ commit to one another to be in relationship, to grow together, to learn together, to suffer together, to celebrate together, to move through life together. That is a source of joy inexpressible. And it is definitely something that God desires for you. In just a few moments, we'll be wrapping up the service. And I'm going to pray for us. And uh, when the service is over, if you are not presently in a grow group, I hope you will make your way to the East Atrium where there are any number of groups, all ages and stations in life, who would love to meet you and love to invite you to be a part of their group. Don't go through this life alone, not when God is holding out such a beautiful gift. I also want to pray, though, for those of us here who would say, you know, I don't know Jesus. And I don't know the joy that you've been talking about of knowing him. But I'd like to learn about that today. I'm going to pray for you too. So why don't we join our hearts together in prayer. Let's bow and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, today we celebrate the fact that you made us to be relational creatures that we have the capacity to know and to love each other. To bring our lives together in such a way that we find strength and joy and hope in the midst of that relationship. I pray, Lord, for every person here today who is not presently in some sort of community that you'd give them the impetus, the motivation to step out into the atrium and to find that group just for them, just for their family. And I pray that it would be a source of joy and strength in their lives. And Lord, I also want to pray for the people who have yet to know the joy of a relationship with you. In fact, since... We've all got our eyes closed. If, if that's you, I, I would really like to pray for you. Would you be willing just to lift your hand up so that I could see it and pray for you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Father, I do pray for these individuals. And I ask right now that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to the truth. That you love them and you want nothing more than to come and live in their heart. Lord, forgive them of their sin and show them that life is theirs for the asking. We pray, oh God, you would be Lord in their lives from this day forward. Thanks for this time. Thanks for this church. And thanks for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Dan Slagle, our care and bridging pastor, who just brought us part one of our Joy Full series. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thanks for having me. You just brought us a great message called Joy Through Community. Uh, walking through the first chapter of Philippians, those first mm -hmm. few verses as Paul talks about how thankful he is for his community as he's in prison. Uh, a couple of questions that came in um, uh, from really two sets of people who might have been listening okay. to the sermon today. So, you know, there are some who came in this morning and, and they might be the person who said, you know, I, I want to take that step. Uh, maybe they walked out uh, into the atrium today, had the boldness to do that, and they picked up that card to go to a grow group for the first time. But they're like, you know what? I know myself, and I know this week it's going to be Wednesday, and I'm supposed to go, and I'm going to cruise up to the house and sure. maybe just go right on by because, yeah. or you know, get busy. I got something to do. You Conveniently, know, yeah. Uh, just that fear of stepping into community, what would you say to that person? How do you overcome that fear and engage in community, especially if it's your first time? Yeah, well, it, absolutely. It, it is a real fear, for sure. Um, I think I would have a, a few words of encouragement. The first one would be, um, many, many people have done this before you. It's not like you're the first one. Sure. And, and many scared people have, have done it. And uh, I think you can take comfort in the knowledge that you're not venturing into completely new territory that others have gone and, and lived to tell it mm -hmm. rather happily. Uh, the second thing that I would say is many of the good things that I have experienced in life came with a measure of risk. Hmm. You got to step out there sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I think you will find, though, that the reward far outweighs the potential risk mm -hmm. in this case. Sure. Um, and then a, a third thing that I would say is um, when you don't go, you're, you're not just robbing yourself. You're robbing the larger body hmm. of your participation. You, you have unique things that God has given you that could be brought to bear on the group and on the larger community here at FaithBridge. And so uh, open up and be willing to share out of your own life for the, the good of, of other people. Sure, yeah, that's good. Um, what about, you know, there's a second group and that's those who were in the audience today and they've been in Grow Group for a while now. They've been actively involved in community, what would you say to them? What's your encouragement to them coming out of today's sermon? What would you hope that they might take away? Well, the first thing I would say is remember the person who is scared. Hmm. You know, make yourself as welcoming and as open as you can possibly be. Hmm. Does your group have the proverbial empty chair hmm. where you are actively seeking people, you're inviting people, uh, no one's having to hunt you down or uh, break in, worse yet, mm -hmm. to a group that's at least emotionally closed, if not technically closed. Uh, be, be the group that you would want if you were in their shoes. Okay. And then the other thing that I would say is talk up group ministry at every opportunity. If, if it is proving to be a blessing in your life and uh, something that is good for you, your marriage, your family, so forth, um, Talk about it. Mm -hmm. Become an apostle of the value of community here. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that will go a long way towards um, not just increasing participation, but also maybe alleviating some of the fears that are out there if it's made a normative mm -hmm. behavior. Well, not just here at FaithBridge, but even in the workplace, you know, so many people are out there living lives of isolation. So yeah. to hear, what did you do this weekend? Well, I spent some time with my grow group. What? What's that? You know, and, <laughs> exactly. And hear that, well, joyful experience that it can be. It's a helpful one to get people to engage. Sure so, thing. Anyway, it can be an evangelism tool as well. Yep. But, well, thank you for your great word today. And thank you for joining us on Postscript. We'll be back next week as we continue part two of our joyful series with Pastor Ken. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services.
Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.